up until this point, all of the units have really been about changes, um, how massive changes in the church and the governments and all these other things, medical space, um, science in general. And this is just another addition to that. So the Enlightenment mostly deals with government policy, and that's going to take place a little bit before the 1700s and all throughout the 1700s as well. As you can see here, the Enlightenment, like I said, had a lot to do with government, but it also changed different parts of the world. Um, all these changes are happening all at one time, and it's just very chaotic in some places, but it's an, it's an evolution into something even better at the other end. So as you can see in front of you, the Enlightenment applied reason. We talked about reason in, in the other unit, but it applies reason to humanity, not just the natural world, but to humanity and human feelings and emotions. Uh, it stimulates religious tolerance. And then again, the big focus that we're going to use here is it fuels democratic revolutions around the world. So I'm going to introduce you to several men that really changed the way that we think about government and they actually laid the foundation for our own government believe it or not we were mostly thieves when it came to the idea of how to run a government remember we started from scratch basically we went from a, a monarchy to a democratic rule almost immediately and we weren't really sure how to do it so we borrowed a lot of ideas from European thinkers the first Enlightenment thinker that we're going to talk about is a man by the name of Thomas Hobbes, and his most famous written work is a book called Leviathan. And basically he argued that humans are selfish and really actually evil, and the state must have authority enough to manage that behavior. But he also said that human beings are not stupid, and we understand that we can easily get out of control, and so they consent to be governed for their own protection. So basically what Thomas Hobbes was saying is that government control is a must, and that is one of the ideas that we used to found this nation, that we knew there had to be a government. Um, you can't not have one. So we used that idea from Thomas Hobbes. And now we come to John Locke. John Locke wrote a lot of things, a lot of political things, but his most famous writing is called Two Treatises on Government. It's basically a pamphlet, and I know he doesn't look like a super brave dude, but he really was. Um, he basically publicly said people are sovereign. In other words, it's the people that really have the right to rule. Um, but then he also said that people consent to the government for things that matter, and the things, according to him, that we have natural rights to. And you need to know the three things that he said we had natural rights to. And those are life, liberty, and property. I know that sounds really familiar and we're gonna come back to why you uh, think that sounds familiar later in the lecture. Um, let's get back to John Locke though. John Locke also was brave enough to say that monarchs are not chosen by God. He did not believe in the idea of divine right where God reaches down and touches a certain family and says you're the ones I want to rule. And this is a time period where many different monarchs across the planet are trying to convince the, their constituents of that because they're doing crazy things and they want uh, a reason to be able to do these cra crazy things and so of course they say God is the one who said that I get to rule and there's nobody more powerful than God and so I can do whatever I want to do and John Locke said no that is not that is not the way that it is that monarchs are not chosen by God and there is no such thing as divine right and so John Locke even though he doesn't look like it pretty brave guy. Make sure you know him for the two treatises on government. Um, you will hear his name again in more history classes. We definitely can't talk about government without including Voltaire. Uh, Voltaire wrote tons and tons of stuff. There's no one specific um, writing that I want you to know for this unit, but I do want you to know that he was a, he wrote historiographies and he is one of the first ones of his time to do that. Now historiography is where you look at writings of acclaimed writers of the time, writers that, that say, you know, I'm an expert on this and you basically tear apart their writings to look for bias to look for uh, whether they are right or wrong. So there's a whole lot of research that goes into uh, 
judging somebody's somebody else's work and Voltaire loved to do this I I really think that Voltaire loved it so much because he loved drama Um, Voltaire was one of those people that loved to be in the mix of things and he was a partier he hung out with Ben Franklin Um, they were drinking buddies he also hung out with Frederick the Great at uh, his palace in Potsdam uh, and went to all these very very extravagant parties he loved to women he had more affairs than we can probably uh, count Um, but he was very open about it his wife knew that he had affairs Uh, he had an affair with his very best friend's wife for more than 20 years and everyone involved knew it his wife her husband um, and he still was invited to dinner at their house all the time and was still considered a best friend to the husband so Voltaire was just super super likable um so he got away with saying a lot of crazy things for his time period oh and by the way in the 1980s he made a comeback with the hair see that see the crazy hair the frizzy hair that was a really big deal in the 1980s for girls especially uh teenage and early 20s and they called it Voltaire hair so see he even influences hairdos in the United States but let's get back to the political side this guy was brave enough to say that that we were not good enough in this country at religious toleration that we were allowing religious fanaticism to take over and that we needed to end that so we needed to be much more religiously tolerant but he also said that we could not combine church and state that we had to have a separation of church and state and I hope you know that here in America uh, our, our laws are very adamant about that that we have a separation of church and state and the reason that Voltaire started this is because well think about the two topics here two of the hottest topics in conversation is religion and government and how are you ever going to make progress in either one when you've got both in the room together it's just not going to happen you've got too many people that get too heated over it and good things are not going to happen change is not going to happen and Voltaire realized this that you couldn't change either one for the better if you got emotional about it that you had to be logical remember this is the enlightenment period this is the age of observation and reasoning and logic and common sense and Voltaire said it's common sense that you can't talk about politics and religion without getting heated and getting too emotional so there you go just make sure you know him for more than anything all the crazy things I just told you uh, don't remember him for a womanizer no remember him for separation of church and state but it's okay if you want to remember the Voltaire hair that is pretty cool I kind of like the style and of course our own beloved Thomas Jefferson Thomas Jefferson who was one of the biggest thieves in uh, our country as far as stealing ideas from European powers to put into our uh, basic documents which is not a bad thing Um, he is the one who wrote the Declaration of Independence of course and he borrowed ideas from John Locke his major idea I told you I was gonna come back to him were the rights of life liberty and property so why did Thomas Jefferson change it if he thought that John Locke was so right um, about these basic human rights why not just keep it life liberty and property well Thomas was pretty forward-thinking remember he's an enlightenment thinker and he went a step further than John Locke and said if I'm gonna make these promises to people as natural rights it has to be things that are attainable and your life and your liberty certainly are attainable even if you have to fight for them but what about property remember now even when Thomas was president and when he became president in in 1800 we didn't know that much about our country we did not know how big it was or how big we might get remember he's the one that sent Lewis and Clark out west to investigate how big this continent was and and we didn't have control of it at the time even if we had known how big it was so his question in his mind was what if one day we run out of property so if I'm promising people that in a document that's going to be the foundation of this country and it's a lie that's not going to be a good thing and so he changed it to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness so we stole it from John Locke but like so many of our other great founding fathers he he thought about how he could take these brilliant ideas and make them fit the American way and so we get John Locke's life liberty and property become Thomas Jefferson's life liberty and pursuit of happiness 
Now I do want you to know one more thing about Thomas Jefferson and this will this will benefit you when you take a US history class. He he is the one that wrote the Declaration of Independence, but he was not there for the writing of the Constitution. And when we learn more about the Constitution later in the year and again next year, um, you, you'll understand why that's so important. Basically, it's that Thomas was not the only thief, that all of our founding fathers were thieves of these brilliant ideas of the Europeans. So I didn't want you to think that he stood by himself. But Thomas Jefferson, a, a, great, a great thinker for the Enlightenment era and an American. Can't be more proud than that. Now we've got to talk about Rousseau. Rousseau is one of those guys that the other founding fathers borrowed um, ideas from. Rousseau is French and he uh, wrote many things as all the others did but his most famous work was called the social contract and basically that's a belief that there's a there's an unwritten contract between all government and the, the people of that government and basically what the contract says is that if your government is good and fair and just then the people have to follow it that that's just the way of the world that the people have to follow it that's the right thing to do but if your government is unjust and and doing bad things to the people of the of the country then those people have the right they actually have the right to rise up and overthrow that country and make change so we took that idea of Rousseau's when we did um, when we did the Constitution and because of Rousseau and those ideas we have methods of getting rid of political entities when they're no longer doing a job and we feel that they're being un unjust such as impeachment of our president if uh, if our president is unjust we can remove him legally uh, because of that we can also recall lower level political figures if they're not doing a, a good job it's actually called recall and we can remove them and replace them so all of that comes from Rousseau again an idea borrowed from France um, key player here for enlightenment ideas in our political documents that founded this nation and this one being the Constitution Montesquieu, um, ugly little guy, I always think that he should have been in the movie The Hobbit. Um, but anyway, poor Montesquieu, you can see that he's French by his name. He uh, wrote lots of stuff too, they all did, but his most famous work is called The Spirit of Laws. And he's the one who said for the very first time, the best form of government includes a separation of powers. So from him, we get the idea of the three branches of government. We stole that right from him. So the legislative, ex executive, and judicial branches are separate, and they form a, set, a system of checks and balances so that none of them become too powerful, and we never end up with a king. That was kind of his, um, his claim to fame and his addition to this great country that we live in. We can't leave the Enlightenment unit without talking about Adam Smith. Adam Smith is actually Scottish. We don't talk about the Scots very often, but he was actually Scottish. Um, he was very heavily involved in British politics and the economy. Um, his most famous work is called The Wealth of Nations, and in that and other writings he talks about this invisible hand that controls the economy and that invisible hand is supply and demand that we will we will supply what the people of a country demand as far as making goods and so because of that supply and demand work hand in hand they work each other out we do not need government control at all to rule the economy if if the government just lets it go laissez-faire let it go let it be then everything will be okay so basically he was saying and this is bold during this time period now this is the 1700s 1770s um, for him to say laissez-faire economics is the way to go government hands off back off we don't need you in the economy that's a big deal think about it now he's talking to a country that's run by a king and he's telling the king to back off and leave the economy alone and stop telling people what to do and how to spend their money and and things like that so of course we brought that to our country and we call that capitalism so Adam Smith make sure you know him for the wealth of nations he basically uh, wrote this as a how-to 
book on capitalism and it is founded on that idea of supply and demand laissez-faire and you also according to Adam Smith uh, in order to have a healthy capitalist nation you have to have competition in the marketplace so um, like I said it's a how-to book so make sure you know that part of this book as far as how to be capitalist that you have to have uh, follow supply and demand follow laissez-faire and healthy competition in the marketplace so I know this was just enthralling to all of you we all love talking about uh, the enlightenment period and all these people that are way smarter than than a lot of people including myself I hope you found a little bit of it interesting here and there they definitely were a a genius bunch of people even if they were a little quirky and you know I'm talking about Voltaire um, but that's the end of this unit so hope you learned something and I will see you in the next one